Okay. Uh, so thank you all for, uh, you know, for attending this last talk of the session and going to talk about a new piece of software that we released in the lab called PyReason. And want to start the discussion with a news article that actually featured some of our lab's other work about chat GPT and mathematical word problems. And it's well known that chat GPT struggles with reasoning and that it uh, does not perform well when you give it a word problem. Well, what was really interesting that we found that didn't make it into this article, well, first, just to give an example, if we have a, uh, a sample word problem here, one number is three times the second, 20 is added to the smaller number, the result is six more than the larger. We can set it up with this system of equations. And then we just do some algebra, we get 2x equals 14, and x equals 7 and 21 is the answer. And so with ChatGPT, we give it the problem in this case. It works through, it starts doing the algebra correctly. But then, if we notice, it's getting uh, the wrong answer. Because it's setting y equals to 14, and it really is 2y equals to 14. And what happens is even though it starts doing the right thing, it initially frames the equations properly. And what we've seen in here, sometimes it'll even do a few steps right. It'll at some point get to a step where it just screws it up and gets an error. And when you look at math word problems, a really interesting proxy for the number of steps it takes is something like the number of addition operations or the number of multiplication operations. And going back to that news article that featured the work, the thing that they didn't cover, we did this test where we put in a bunch of math word problems with different size. What is this? Now what happens here is problems of different types and some of these required only a few addition and subtraction operations, some required a lot. And what we did is we measured the probability of failure, just simple fraction, how many times it got it wrong. And it came with this very nice relationship, you know, very nice linear fit to the data. As we had more additions and subtractions, the more likely it was to be wrong. And we looked at this with respect to ground truth for the math word problems. We conducted a similar experiment where we looked at the equations reported by ChatGPT itself and recovered the same linear relationship. This relationship also held for different versions of ChatGPT, different types of prompts. The uh, line would shift, the intercept would shift based on something like the prompt, but the relationship would always be there. No matter what we did, we couldn't make this relationship go away. And I think it's because it can't do multi-step reasoning. It can maybe get away with its kind of, you know, memorization or some people call it the stochastic parrot to a point but then at some point it makes one mistake and that mistake propagates through the rest. So, can such systems think? So can we take a machine learning system like ChatGPT? Can we infuse domain knowledge? Can we allow it to draw conclusions from that knowledge? And we can, can we allow it to do multi-step inference? And so there is a large wealth of work on symbolic reasoning. But the thing is, is that symbolic reasoning tends to take place using discrete objects, discrete mathematics, whereas neural networks and machine learning is largely continuous. So how do we get the two to meet together? And so we need to think about what kind of logical paradigm can enable us to do things like multi-step reasoning and allow us to still connect with, connect the logic to a deep learning model. We need to go beyond just trues and falses in the logic and actually allow for an open world quality, I would argue. 
And of course, we should optimize this and have this run on modern hardware and in modern IDEs like Python. So uh, there are some, you know, moderately famous work from the 90s uh, by two well-known logicians, Michael Kiefer and Via Subramanian, and it was called Generalized Annotated Logic, and it's a, a theoretical framework that they were able to prove a lot of aspects about a very generalized logic where the logical elements were associated with a lattice structure, not simply true and false. And a lot of desirable properties were retained by this. And so the idea is if you have a lattice structure, you have a series of elements, you could start reasoning at the bottom. Everything starts out with this initial lattice element, and it can go up the lattice. Now, if you look at a classical logic, when you have what's called a closed world assumption, everything starts out as false and becomes more true. When you associate real values with that, and you say, well, I don't want to be true or false. I want to have a number between 0 and 1. Normally, what's done is you start out at 0, and things approach 1 as you reason more. But this isn't how we reason in real life. We start out with thinking, hey, things are uncertain. And that's the beauty of the lattice. We can assign, instead of just a zero, we say truth lies between zero and one, which is total uncertainty, not falsehood. And as you go up the lattice, things can approach total falsehood with a zero, zero, or total truth with a one, one. And so the results of Kiefer and Subramanian allow for us to reason this way and still preserve a lot of good theoretical properties, such as we can restrict the logic and retain polynomial time inference, which allows things to be very efficient. And for those of you who don't realize, polynomial inference is actually the main thing that enables neural networks to work in the first place. This is why we have a feed-forward design and not something else. So there's been some extensions to this over the years, doing things like, hey, can we add time to it? Can we add a underlying graphical structure to the logic? And the short story is we can do these things and we still retain the desirable properties of annotated logic. So what we did is we took all of these ideas and we created an efficient Python implementation that we're calling Pyres. And so PyReason takes as input an initial knowledge graph. And so this is a graph where you have the edges and nodes, kind of multiple labels and weights. And actually, the weights can be represented as intervals because we're using this lattice structure. And a series of rules that are if a precondition happens, then a postcondition happens after a certain amount of time. And the relationship between those is dictated by a very generic function. And that function can be something like a t-norm used to represent a logical and, but it could be pretty much anything else, including functions that are differentiable, or functions that are parameterized, or functions that just come from something external to the software that is a black box. And so we implemented annotated logic in PyReason. We did machine level optimizations to make it very fast and scalable, but it has a Python front end to make it usable for modern developers. And what you get as an output is you get the evolution of this graph over time, how it changes based on the logical rules. And additionally, the ability to aggregate the values associated with logical elements. So you can embed things like a reward function for reinforcement learning. So PyReason is available for download. Uh, we're already getting a bunch of people downloading it. We have several industry partners using it, and we're using it across multiple programs in the lab. And so there's a lot of nice resources available already. You can download it from GitHub or install it with PIP. And to give you a quick example, here's a supply chain use case. Very simple supply graph. We have um, components. So these are components. and are production, so different 
uh, production nodes, maybe representing companies, they're supplying something for a component. And we have two logical rules for those of you who like first order logic, I wrote it down in that. But basically they're saying if a single component of a product fails uh, from time t to t prime, then the product node also fails at the next time unit. And if all suppliers for a component fail, then the component fails uh, from time t plus one to time t prime plus one. So very simply, if we see these two nodes fail at time one, nothing else fails because nothing else happens instantly. But at the next time period, now we have three nodes fail dictated by this logic. Now that component node causes the next P node to fail. But notice the other two nodes have recovered. So what's neat about this is we can do non-monotonic reasoning across time where things can be true or false at different time points, provided within a time point it moves up the lattice and we preserve the polynomial time property. And then this finishes out with only the one failure node that also eventually recovers. And so in terms of scaling, you know, we were able to produce visualizations like this for a moderately sized network. We already uh, scaled this up to uh, networks of up to 32 million edges and then commodity hardware, we processed that in about under half hour. Uh, we've, you know, we think this thing can scale quite well. Um, empirical results indicate that scaling is either linear or sublinear depending on the uh, structure of the problem. So what's the use case for this? Well. Uh, interestingly enough, the use case in reinforcement learning has emerged as something very important. So here's traditional reinforcement learning. You have a simulator, you have a reward function, and then an agent taking an action based on a policy. Okay? And so big problems with this that everyone knows about is it's slow, it requires a lot of simulation, and this simulator is the bottleneck. Oftentimes, too, it's going to take actions and it can't be explained. So the idea here is not to replace deep reinforcement learning. We're going to keep that. And we're just going to replace the simulator with PyRes. Now, this isn't a model-based approach. This is not an MDP. And remember what I showed you with the other example, PyRes and what happens in the current time step is not only dependent on the previous time step. It's arbitrary. It just depends on what you have specified. Also, unlike an MDP, we can allow for open world reasoning. So we don't have to represent all the aspects of the transition function uh, in a logic program in PyReason. So it's going to be more compact. So if you do this with PyReason, compared to a native sim, you should get much better performance because everything here is symbolic. You'll get an element of explainability because you'll see the trace. You'll understand the causes and effects of the action the agent take, has taken, even if you're using deep RL. And what's really neat where we're going with this is it's inherently modular. So I can train a agent to act in an environment specified by a logic program. And because that policy itself is symbolic, I can throw it back into the logic program and have that act as a new agent to train some other agent to do something different. And so what we did was with a simple game scenario that we had, we're working with some partners using both uh, StarCraft and AFSIM, which is the big uh, simulator from the Air Force. We created scenarios that represented the scenarios they used in those using logical rules that look something like this. And you see here we have annotations with one ones and zero zeros and stuff like that. So some things can be true or false that causes a change. And so looking at runtime performance uh, compared to the native sim in both AFSIM and uh, uh, StarCraft, we're getting you know, about uh, several hundred to around a thousand times speed up improvement. So you might say, well, that's great, but is the agent you're training, does it, is it any good? How does it do when you throw it back in the sim? So the answer is, is actually does quite well. Um, the difference in reward 
is, you know, we're seeing anywhere from like one to 7% in reward. When you look at the win rate, uh, it's actually much closer. The high reason trained agents actually did a little bit better in, uh, in the native sim than in Pi Reason in one setting, and in this one was uh, slightly worse by about half a percent. So, and if you know anything about reinforcement learning, these kind of variances are common. So, um, you know, we felt pretty good about these results. Now, what's interesting is going beyond, uh, you know, what was in those games that we had, which were kind of standard Markovian. So, for example, in StarCraft, if the agent is turns and sees an enemy agent, it automatically starts shooting at the opponent. And this is clear limitation. It's not very realistic. And so we thought, well, in Pi Reason, we want to create a version of that sim that allows uh, for the agent to take an action to decide to shoot. Now, what's interesting about shooting is shooting is an instantaneous action. So if I have my agent decide to move, if it's a you know, if it's a person or a vehicle and it's moving a little bit, that movement I just did is much, much slower than the speed of a bullet. However, Pi Reason, since it allows for non-Markovian reasoning, I can have different time scales operating all at the same time. And in doing this, we could just do some simple adjustments to uh, DQN uh, reinforcement learning training, and we could train an agent that can account for non-Markovian properties, and it outperforms the agent that just considers only a Markovian version of the situation. With this, we get a semantic trace, and this is just what this looks like, where you see uh, this is part of a, a scenario where you see everything that happens to the agent described with uh, symbolic logic. And What's important about this is it's not just an explanation. It's not like there's a lot of work going on nowadays where something like a large language model is used to provide a sort of rough interpretation of what's going on with the reinforcement learning. Here it's symbolic, which means that we can use other algorithms to analyze the results or make decisions or, or do other problems. And so just as a summary, you know, reasoning is a challenge for machine learning and deep learning systems. They're essentially not designed to do that, and that's okay. Annotated logic, though, provides a way that we can interface between logic, the discrete world of logic, and the continuous world of machine learning. High reasoning is a modern implementation of this, and we've recently uh, started using this as a way uh, to act as a semantic proxy in deep reinforcement learning, but there are other ways we are using this as well. For example, we are looking at uh, abduction problems uh, using this type of logic to generate movement patterns uh, for individuals in an urban environment that meet certain constraints. So a very different problem. Notice it has similar sound to generative AI until I said the word and meet constraints. Generative AI is generally not going to permit you to do that. Uh, we are modeling uh, supply chain networks, building on some of these toy examples I showed, going to supply networks that are global. So relationships between ports and shipping and commodities and stuff like that. And we're also looking to use this to reason about machine learning algorithms themselves. Some of you may have seen uh, the poster that some of my students had about error detection and correction rules. Uh, we are going to enhance that using Pi Reason to allow multi-step inference to reason about failures in ML systems. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Yes? Do you have any uh, tutorials on your website so that we can try? And yeah, we do. So we have a Hello World program, a couple videos, some readmes and stuff like that. And if that's not enough, let me know and I'll put you in touch with some of the people who uh, worked on. And how can we use this in our classes if you want to, for example, my teacher robotics class? So how can I use this fantastic tool to teach So, I mean, I think, you know, That's what I, mean. I yeah, I think one way to think about it, you know, well, I think reinforcement learning, I think this could become a good tool for that. 
because it gives you kind of a generic environment to play with deep RL. Um, that, that might be useful for that. Um, you know, we're starting to build out, so the abduction work I told you about, uh, the optimization routine for that is A star. And so we're modifying A star to work well with this. And there's a really nice theoretical relationship between heuristic functions and, and the logic programs. And so, yeah, a lot of that we'll be releasing over time as it's ready. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> so what is the time of the last talk? Oh, at 3.30. Uh, so at 3.30? I know it's 345 yeah and so the final talk of uh, AI day will be here it will be uh, Professor Baral and that will be at 345 so coffee break is fine.